truths to be self-evident. That all men are created. As a member of Congress, I get to have a lot of really interesting people in the office. Experts on what they're talking about. This is the podcast. For insights into the issues. China, bioterrorism, Medicare for all. In-depth discussions. Breaking it down into simple terms. We hold. We hold. We hold these truths. We hold these truths. With Dan Crenshaw. The eagle has landed. Welcome back, guys. Let's talk nuclear energy. Uh, Tell me with that. I've got a friend here from... uh, my own committee, Energy and Commerce. Jeff Duncan, thanks for being on. Well, Dan, it's great to be on with you today. So uh, from your accent, you're a New York representative, and uh, you're here to talk nuclear energy with us. I am, and uh, <laughs> I wish New York would get on the nuclear train, but in South Carolina, where I am from, we uh, we love nuclear power. We get about 50% of our powers generated by nuclear. I, I didn't know that. Yeah. That's a lot. Yeah. That's significant. Yeah. Okay, so... Um, I, I like this topic, and, I, and it, well, it's timely because we got COP26 coming up. Well, it's already going on. Um, but Did you go over there? I haven't gone over yet. Okay. Going over, as, as we record this, uh, I'll be over there what, Saturday, something like that. And um, I'm going to go dressed up as a dinosaur, you know? You just, I, I saw your IG on that. Did, did you see that? But did you see the what I was referring to? I did not. Okay. Okay. So it didn't make any sense to you. I told you that meme wouldn't make sense, Justin. (laughs) (laughs) So, (laughs) okay. You haven't seen it? Is it where the dinosaur is talking about, you know, I've got to do something? Yeah, I think I have seen it. Okay. Let's play it. Listen up, people. You're headed for a climate disaster. And yet every year, governments spend hundreds of billions of public funds on fossil fuel subsidies. Imagine if we had spent hundreds of billions per year subsidizing giant meteors. That's what you're doing right now. Around the world, people are living in poverty. Don't you think helping them would make more sense than, I don't know, paying for the demise of your entire species? You've got a huge opportunity right now. As you rebuild your economies and bounce back from this pandemic, So here's my wild idea. Don't choose extinction. Save your species before it's too late. It's time for you humans to stop making excuses and start making changes. Thank you. Okay, so uh, as you see there, a, a, a climate dinosaur a, a a like a graphic or a whatever an, an animated graphic of a dinosaur in the voice of jack black is going up and lecturing everybody at the un about how they're going to go extinct and it's just it's just the most ridiculous video ever uh so anyway that's that's what i'm talking about it's 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 there's a lot of fanfare a lot of performance going on around this this summit and um it d- doesn't seem like serious conversation um you know, with respect to nuclear energy, I was told the U.S. delegation didn't even go to the whatever meeting there was, whatever the presentation there was on new fusion te- technology. Um, apparently, there's actually a prototype of, of a fusion reactor being built uh, in, in the next few years, which is fascinating. Well, yeah, it's called an ITER project, I-T-E-R, and the U.S. has a component. So I think it's seven or eight countries that are all working together. And um, I visited uh, General Atomics uh out in San Diego that's actually building the magnets that will hold the fusion reaction inside, yeah. keep it from escaping. So that's the U.S. component of it. So it'll all be brought together in Europe, and um, it's, it's fascinating. Fusion's, you know, a, it's not a far-gone conclusion. I think it could be a reality. It's still mm-hmm. got a long ways to go. We know it works, though, and that's fission reactors, and that's mm-hmm. uh, the future technology that, whether small modular reactors or molten salt reactors, um, advanced reactor styles are coming online. So let's talk about that in, South, in the context of South Carolina for a second. Uh, 50% is a pretty impressive amount of your, your, your energy mix <laughs> going on nuclear. Um, you sound like France. I mean, <laughs> I think yeah. they have more, but... Not yeah. that I don't want to compare you to France. I don't, no, I don't we, want to we don't really South like the French there. out yeah. there. Yeah. But um, how does that work out for your for your state? It works out great, and um, we've got to think about the future. You know, we we were bringing some natural gas down to uh, the Carolinas, and uh, because of uh, litigation, that pipeline was stopped, called the Atlantic Coast Pipeline. So we've got to think about the future and how we're going to meet the electrical needs of um, both residential and industrial components 10 15 20 years down the road and nuclear's got to be a big part of that i hope to see you know advanced nuclear technology brought to, mm-hmm. to the state uh, are, are, are your electricity prices any higher in south carolina no 
No. We, we have pretty stable electricity prices. Duke Energy is a big player. We also have a lot mm-hmm. of cooperatives. And um, in my district, we have uh, the Oconee Nuclear Station, which has three reactors. And I visited the plant numerous times. And, you know, safety is phenomenal there. A big part of uh, Duke Energy's uh, energy matrix is nuclear power, both at mm-hmm. that plant and also over at the Catawba plant, which is closer to Charlotte. Uh, let's talk about some of the misconceptions on safety. So there's not like a green toxic ooze uh, turning turning fish into fish with three eyes. Only on the that. Simpsons, uh, yeah. you know. Yeah. So, <laughs> so yeah. it's, I mean, what, what are some of the misconceptions here? Um, and, you know, what, what, what do people get wrong about nuclear, nuclear waste, how, how dangerous it is, how close you can be to, to a site, all of it? Mm-hmm. I mean, there are residential communities right there by the nuclear reactors in uh, Oconee County. Do you think they even know that? Yeah, they know it's there. Yeah. So, you know, both, so they're that uh, close. Both I mean, the employers, and you can see it on the highway, and it's right on the shores of Lake Kiowee, which is a huge uh, mountain lake there. And um, they understand the economic impact that that plant has on the community. So, you know, safety in the United States is uh, something we take serious. And um, unfortunately, you see Netflix run a, a show like Chernobyl which yeah. is a documentary, which you learn a lot from. But I believe that it's scaring future generations. What happened um, in Chernobyl? Well, like that, first that, off, is, that is different than what could happen in South Carolina. Well, first off, you don't want to let communists run or build nuclear power plants where you have... She's <laughs> not good at know, anything. No, they aren't. <laughs> and um, But what happened there is you had uh, graphite on the end of a control rod, and mm-hmm. graphite actually facilitates nuclear reaction versus stopping a nuclear reaction. So they, uh, it was a poor design there. And then you had, um, when when the reaction started running away, the communists just could not act quick enough. Yeah. And um, so, and it was in know, the that's early. That's not going to happen in the United States. Our designs are a lot different. Than that. Yeah. What year was Chernobyl? Oh, was that, that was the, in my lifetime, so the late yeah, '80s, yeah, early late '90s. 80s, yeah. yeah. Um, At the yeah. end of Gorbachev's term, so yeah. I mean that was probably one of the attributing factors there. Yeah, bad deal, but but nuclear is a very long safety record in the United States, and it turns out we put these tiny little reactors uh, on submarines, and then we put a bunch of people in those submarines, and we keep them there for a very long time, and we put them underwater, we put them under great duress, we also put a bunch of nuclear missiles on the submarines. I mean, <laughs> you know, this this stuff happens to be safe, and there's no um, there, there's there's no indication it's not carriers the same thing. I mean, I I I. I I think, what do you think about the public opinion? Is it is it shifting on this or, or is it even reaching people? I don't think, I think we have a huge, and I'm glad you're doing this podcast, we have a huge um, need to educate the public on the safety of nuclear power, the future of nuclear power, what it means when you talk about small modular reactors, mm-hmm. which you just hit on. At any given time, we have over 100 small reactors floating around the seas of the world, the United States Navy and our merchant marine fleet um, that are safe. And there's there's small reactors. You've got people living in very close proximity to those reactors because a submarine is relatively small. So, you know, the safety is there. But then you have an event like Fukushima, which was a natural disaster with a with a tsunami that took out the cooling mechanisms. Mm-hmm. It didn't have anything to do with the reactor itself. It had to do with the yeah. cooling aspect of it, and you took out the generators and the pumps. So um, we learned from that, mm-hmm. and I don't think that will ever happen again. Yeah. Um, we figure out with Chernobyl, you figure out that you don't put graphite on the end of control rods and you, uh, actually learn about nuclear fission and how to control that, uh, that yeah. reactor in the, in the core temperature. So what, what is getting in our way then of, of building more? It seems pretty obvious that if, if we really thought that the world was going to end in, you know, 12 years or a hundred years or whatever the, whatever the new hotness is and the climate alarm is left, um, the world is on fire is their new favorite catchphrase. Uh, if we really think that, then we'd want to reduce emissions as, as fast as possible while also not sacrificing energy reliability. You would think we'd want to build these things rather quickly. Um, you know, leaving the politics aside, but we can get into that all day long um, on, on, on how they think about these things. And, and, and the, I think the, the pathological obsession with solar and wind that they engage in, we could talk about that all day long. But if somebody then asks us, okay, well, you know what? I'm with you. I'm with you. Uh, gas, nuclear, the, you, your arguments make a lot of sense. So, so how do we build these things? What, what's getting in our way right now in America, um, building more reactors? Yeah, well, I think first uh, you hit on it. You can't have a really serious conversation about um, global carbon emissions without including a conversation mm-hmm. with nuclear. That's why I believe uh, this, this um, convention or whatever you want to call it that they're having on climate 
leaving nuclear out of that mix, not allowing the nuclear um, technology to be inside whatever yeah. the green zone, and they're they're there, but they're outside of the the main um, hmm. area, is wrong. Because you can learn a lot about how nuclear power actually contributes to lowering carbon emissions globally. And when I see uh, China, which is going to build 150 new nuclear reactors over the next 15 years, you go, China gets this. They it, they are one of the largest emitters of carbon mm-hmm. because of all the coal-fired power plants. They can set these modular reactors into an existing coal-fired power plant, use that existing system, but now the nuclear reaction will provide the heat to turn the water to steam and create electricity. So they don't have to build out more infrastructure. So I, oh, I see what China's doing. So to answer your question, what's the, what's the hindrance here in the United States of America? And it's definitely the bureaucratic state and the regulatory quagmire that we have. Mm-hmm. And it costs too much money and takes way too much time to replicate uh, or to build new reactors where you're just replicating what you've already done successfully. Yeah. And um, I'm not advocating for a cookie-cutter approach to nuclear power, but if a nuclear power design has been approved, you shouldn't have to go through the whole regulatory process over and over and over and over that just drives the cost up and delays it. So uh, I have a bill that actually streamlines the regulatory process. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you've already done it, there's no need to replicate uh, the, the, the environmental reviews or the or the regulatory burdens that the uh, nuclear industry has to face. So uh, Democrats, in our committee at least, uh, they, they, they speak in favor of nuclear, but it seems like they talk out of both sides of the mouth because they speak they talk in favor. They talk a good game. But, yeah, uh, but, but then they, don't, they won't support your bill. Right. I mean, right. They, they won't because because we passed some bills um, out under the last minute under the Trump administration that were pro nuclear bipartisan. Um, but, you know, this isn't one of they're not willing to go to the extent that you need to go to, to really make this economical. Yeah. That's I mean, so as we talked about earlier, they believe in climate change. They believe that we need to do something about carbon emissions. So they need to embrace nuclear, but then they won't. You know, McNerney's been a good one over there. But even Debbie Dingell has talked a good game on nuclear, but when it comes down to voting for something, she won't. So, yeah, we're, know, we're always asked the question in that committee, well, w- w- would you want a nuclear waste uh, storage unit in your, in your state? And I'm like, yeah, sure. It's Texas. I mean, yeah. for God's sakes, but, but also we have Yucca Mountain. So can we talk about that for a second? Because Absolutely. this is, this is something that everybody zeroes in on. Well, what are you going to do with the waste? I mean, it's such a big problem. And I'm like, not as big of a problem as solar panel waste, not as big of a problem as wind turbine waste. It, 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 this is non-recyclable. Uh, in the case of solar panels, highly toxic. It's, it's a lot worse than I think people have, have <coughs> originally estimated. So let, let's get that straight, first of all. First, okay, let's, let's paint a picture for people. What does nuclear waste even look like? And um, why can't we just store it all in Yucca Mountain? I thought it was, it was a facility that was ready to, ready to take it in. Yeah, nuclear waste, uh, first off, should be reprocessed. France gets about 95% that's, of the available a good point. power yeah. out of the same fuel rods, and we're getting 5% out of. So reprocessing ought to be a part of that. That was poo-pooed by Jimmy Carter's administration because ultimately through reprocessing, after many times you end up with plutonium. So right. they didn't want right. the proliferation side of it. But, um, but so this, is, nu- this is domestic we're talking about. Right. You know, I mean, that's easy to, to keep security around. Yeah, I don't know what the hell they're thinking. I mean, yeah, because you're losing a ton of efficiency doing that. And so, and the Navy, by the way, does do that. I mean, highly efficient reactors by right. by using basically a weapons grade enriched uranium. That's right. And and France has done it for decades and and know how to do it. And we should do that, but uh, we don't. Uh, we ought to change that policy first and foremost. Nuclear waste sits at 120 sites in 37 states. It sits on the shores of Lake Erie. It sits on the shores of Lake Kiwi and a lot of rivers and other water bodies around the country. Um, it's safe. It's either sitting in dry cask or wet pool storage where it's just sitting there, you know, fizzing away, I guess. We have spent a lot of money, Dan, in this country to find a geologically pure site to store the nation's nuclear waste, both mm-hmm. commercial waste and defense waste. And that site was Yucca Mountain. And I've been out there. I've stood on the mountain, and I said, you know, if we can't put the nuclear waste here, we can't put it anywhere. Is this we'll in the never, middle of nowhere? Yes, that- in the middle of nowhere. A chigger can't even live out there. And um, it, it's just desolate. It's the most desolate place I've ever been other than the Dead Sea. Yeah. And so standing on that mountain, I'm, I'm thinking to myself, if, if we can't put it here, 
Yeah. We're never going to be able to go through, due to politics, go through the whole process again, spend the amount of money again to find another site that will accept it. And if we do, will the politics change in that state and we waste all that money again? We have already done all the work, and that site is, you know, it's not 50% because they still have to build the vault for it, but they've built the ingress and egress tunnels mm -hmm. to bring the waste in and the trucks to leave, and they've got to build a vault. This vault is 1,000 feet below solid granite. Yeah. And then it's another 1,000 feet to an aquifer. And it's a dry area that gets no rain. Water's the biggest transmitter of nuclear material in that situation. But there's no rain out there. It's, it's a great site, but politics has gotten in the way. And uh, so what are we going to do with it? If we don't reprocess, it's going to continue to sit in the sites, 120 sites in 37 mm -hmm. states around the country. Right. Yeah, they just store it on site. Yeah. And um, how long can we keep doing that, you think? You know, it does, you know, nuclear material isn't that large. People think it's just this mm -hmm. huge amount, and it really doesn't take that much room to store it. In fact, where at Okona Nuclear Station, where that sits, looks like a little mini warehouse area out there. It's actually sitting in uh, dry casks there, uh, and it can sit there forever, mm -hmm. but it shouldn't. You know, people in my district don't want to have the waste there. They like the nuclear power. They expect us and the federal government to actually do something, and we have. We spent the money. We've, we've done the research, and we've got the place for it. So let's reprocess it so we don't have to create new nuclear material. And we could just continue, and that probably gets you decades out. Mm -hmm. And then let's have a long-term repository. And I think that with the gray matter we have that God's given us, we'll figure out, you know, fusion, and we'll figure out other areas to deal with the waste and actually generate power from it going forward. Well, one of the arguments the left always has on this is, you know, well— Takes even if we decided to build 500 more nuclear plants in the United States, uh, it would, you know, 10 to 15 years before they're all built. That's fair. That's true. And we can't wait that long, right? We can't wait that long. We got to reduce our emissions by 45 percent by 2030. Um, you know, uh, what do you think about that? I mean, my, my take on that is you're kind of giving us a false timeline. First of all, uh, you know, and and this is this is when when I quibble with the environmentalists, I'm like, look, I, I accept the premise of climate change mostly, mostly. But I'm listening to the UN IPCC data. I don't think you are. <laughs> like that's because what it really says is there's going to be a cost. But it's like, I mean, uh, th this is this is the best fact that I like repeating over and over again from that UN report. Right. And it just drives people crazy because it's in the worst case warming scenario of a four degree Celsius warming scenario, which is completely unreasonable, by the way. It assumes that we increase our use of coal globally. It, it assumes that we... We stop using renewables, all of it. It's a, it's a crazy assumption, but it's about a four degree Celsius warming. Even with that, you'd get a four and a half percent decrease in global GDP in the year 2100. Now, that's not a decrease from what our global GDP is now. It's a decrease from what it otherwise would be in 100 years, which is like three to six times bigger than what it is now. Isn't that, it's incredible um, how <laughs> how this... How what is a cost is indeed real and is a cost has been has been transformed into this sort of alarmist scenario by by so many people and people just eat it up. But it's just not what the report says. So given that, it's like uh, my take on it is you do have more time than you think. You don't have to scare your children into tears, right? Um, we you know <laughs> it's it's it drives me crazy, and I'm I'm glad I'm glad Republicans in general um, have sort of. Uh, centered around this message that I think if people find extremely reasonable, um, which is important, especially in the wake of what just happened in Virginia, people are looking for reasonable solutions to things. It turns out policy does matter. You know, Bruce Westerman has a great bill. If, let's, let's figure out how to take carbon out of the atmosphere. We can plant a trillion trees mm -hmm. and uh, quit cutting the rainforest and all these issues that in our lifetime, we've heard about the rainforest and in, in uh, the Amazon you know, it's just common sense not to cut those trees, but we can replicate uh, that by planting trees. Yeah, they take carbon out of the atmosphere. But you, st you going back to nuclear power, you cannot have a, a viable argument in this country about how to deal with global emissions without including nuclear power. I think China sees that they're the largest emitter, and they realize they're not a good player on the world stage. In order to be, we've got to reduce carbon emissions, so we're going to build more nuclear they're, power. They're, they're setting themselves up to be heroes in 2030, so they say because they agreed to uh, increase emissions up until 2030, and it's you know it, <laughs> they really are good at this game. They're good at the propaganda game. It's like they're communists or something, yeah. and it's, it's like it's bred <laughs> into them. Uh, and so, cause if you're China, you're like, okay, I'm going to keep emitting until 2030. I'm going to build last year. They built three times more coal capacity than the rest of the world combined. So they're building tons and tons of emissions. And they've been doing that for a decade or more. So they're just wildly increasing their emission share. 
But by the year 2030, all of this more cleaner energy will be on board. They'll still be emitting, I, I bet, by, I'm not sure what the estimates are, but I have a feeling their share will continue to increase. Right now, it's like 27%. I bet it'll continue to increase. And then it'll be extremely easy for their economy, for their society to reduce emissions. And I'll like, oh, look at us. We're just reducing emissions after we hit this peak. I mean, it's, it's uh, how we all fell for that. Well, not all of us fell for it, right. but how <laughs> Democrats in this country fell for it and the rest of the world fell for it is, is completely insane. You know, yeah. and, the, and the, that should be all this climate conference is about in Scotland right now is, yeah, we all need to get together on something, but it should be getting together and pointing the finger at China and saying, none of, none of any, anything we do doesn't matter unless you guys do something. That's right. China, Russia, India, some of the, what they call emerging economies, they give them a pass on mm -hmm. because the United States has already emerged. You've got a great economy and you ought to reduce your emissions. We're yeah. going to allow China to continue to cheat and get away with all but these. We already did. Yeah. <laughs> What's amazing in this is that the United States, we didn't sign Kyoto, we didn't sign the Paris Climate Accord, but yet we have reduced emissions. And it's because of uh, American innovation, entrepreneurialism, and the, doing the right thing. It's not because other countries are telling us to do it, it's because we're doing the right thing. All right, so back to making it a, a little easier to, to, to make nuclear reactors. Um, another regulatory barrier that I hear gets in the way is this um, expansive notion of how much land you actually need for a reactor, how much like uh, that safety space that you need, that safety barrier, whatever the technical term is. Um, is. Is that reasonable, the way the regulations are right now? Is there something we can do to change that too and w w further reduce the costs? I think absolutely we can reduce that. And when we talk about small modular reactors that can power you know, large neighborhoods in Texas or small cities, mm -hmm. other places, the footprint's got to be a lot smaller, at least the safety barrier. And we've learned a lot. I, I think about Oconee Nuclear Station in our area. There are houses within, you know, a mile, mile and a half, whatever that safety okay. barrier is around there. But, um, yeah, you're right. If you think about land use, though, a nuclear power plant sits on, let's say, a two-mile square Yeah, you know, with safety barriers and all that. Do you know how much land it takes for a solar or a wind farm? I do, but tell the audience. Oh, my <laughs> gosh. To get the same uh, wattage out of a nuclear power plant, it would take – you know, this huge amount, 70 square miles or some, some yeah, god-awful number. Yeah. It's massive. So it's about 100, and I calculated, it. it's about 140 times more space for from solar, about almost almost 400 times more space from wind. From wind. Yeah, because of the setback of the, of yeah. the windmills. But um, can we afford to use that for that type of power generation when you can shrink the footprint, have a nuclear power plant mm -hmm. there, yeah. and, and create... Reliable. Safe, <laughs> you know, reliable, 24-7, yeah. 365 baseload power, always on, always ready and available. Yeah. I mean, God forbid we do things that make sense. Um, the subsidies, would even if you do all that, even if you cut through all those regulations, uh, is, do you think that the market will still need some kind of subsidies for nuclear? Worth noting, solar and wind get about 250 times more subsidies per unit of energy than nuclear does. So even just equalizing that, equalizing what the, you know, with the IPC tax credits, those kind of things, um, technology neutral tax credits for carbon free energy. Uh, is it, you think that's something Republicans should support? They probably would. But at the end of the day, we shouldn't pick winners or losers in the energy yeah. markets. We should allow them, the markets to step up. We know that nuclear power is proven. Um, we know we can lower the cost by yeah. changing the regulatory burdens and uh, shrinking the timeline that it takes to build a new nuclear plant. If you're going to put any incentives out there, put it for emerging technologies, whether that's thorium molten salt reactors or whether it's small modular reactors or, mm -hmm. you know, hydrogen cooled or whatever the new technology is. Yeah. I look to the United States Navy, you've got small reactors and you're reprocessing, you know, let's take that and apply it to the commercial sector instead of building these huge uh, reactors. Let's go smaller. Let's go uh, more efficient. Let's mm -hmm. go modular that can be replaced. China's going to take modular reactors and drop them into their coal-fired power plants, do away with the coal, use that modular reactor to provide the heat, yep. and uh, they've already got it, all the other uh, infrastructure there. And there's just no reason we, we can't do that. I no, mean, I, No reason I, at all, I, I other don't. than the bureaucrats. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, I'm not sure the audience, I'm not even sure I understand. W why is it so much better to, to move towards these small modular reactors? Is it, um, it what is it about? Because they obviously provide less power. It, it's not like you're getting more power from a smaller reactor. It's, 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 is, it, it's, is it simply the, the flexibility of it? Yeah, the modular part of it, the component. If uh, uh, something in the module 
goes bad, you just pull the module out and replace it. It's like, I see. you know, an electric motor and an electric car. If it goes bad, you just pop the motor out, put an electric motor in. That's one of the efficiencies of uh, EVs. Huh. So modular technology is it's all self-contained as a module. You just drop it in place and start generating power. I see. How and we have we have put some government funding towards research and development on that front. I mean, how, how close are we to commercializing that? Commercializing, I don't know. The, actually, having one up and running that we can go look at and and study and and uh, get the regulatory burden right is a lot quicker than we think. There are several different companies out there that are doing different Mm -hmm. advanced nuclear reactors, whether it's modular or thorium or whatever, all over the country. Yeah. And eventually you're going to have one that emerges as the winner, the one that's the most efficient, that's the most cost efficient, uh, that the timeline is a lot quicker and get online, start lowering our carbon emissions or providing power sooner. Is, are the, are the react, is the reactor mix in, in South Carolina, again, 50% is a pretty impressive number, is, is that sort of grandfathered in, um, or did South Carolina more recently take any uh, policy actions that, that helped that industry? Yeah, it's kind of interesting that you asked that. Uh, our reactors are decades old there, both the Catawba, Oconee, uh, VC Summer, but we were building new reactors at VC Summer, and there was huge cost overruns there company ended up going bankrupt and uh, shutting down those new nuclear reactors. At the same time, just across the Savannah River in Georgia, Augusta, Georgia, they have uh, the Vogel plant. Mm -hmm. And um, it was on the same timeline for those reactors to come online. They were able to manage a little better, actually invested some money, had some of the same cost overrun problems, were made a commitment, invested the money. And those reactors are going to come online a lot quicker. They'll be the first reactors permitted uh, in decades Mm -hmm. in the South. So... um, that's a good thing. That's going to be a part of the Southern energy mix. Yeah. But uh, South Ghana is unfortunately not going to play a part in that because of what happened at VC Summer. I see. I see. Uh, anything else going on in Congress, in politics, that you want to hit on while, while I've got you? Well, a great day in Virginia yesterday. And, there was. Um, you know, Even New Jersey is New ridiculously Jersey is close. close. Well, I mean, we'll I, I've, I never really thought we'd win that, but I don't think we will. But unbelievably close. Well, I think what's missed in this uh, Virginia race is that the House of Delegates flipped. Yeah. Yeah, I saw that. By one. They yeah. got one. They got a one seat. And you had majority. an African-American lieutenant governor for the first yep. time in the yeah. country, not just in Virginia. Yeah, she's awesome. And you had a Hispanic uh, attorney general win. Mm-hmm. You know, Republicans are criticized for not having diversity, but look at this. Look at this mm-hmm. in Virginia. This is the South. And you have an African-American now as a lieutenant governor. Mm-hmm. You have a Hispanic as an attorney general. Um People forget that the first black Republicans, in, or sorry, the first black members of Congress were Republicans. Were Republicans, absolutely. Yeah. But, you know, that doesn't meet the narrative that Democrats want to push out there. Yeah. But you know, it's a big day, and I think it all points to the Biden administration's policies. Americans are, have figured out that these are hurting their families. Uh, they're paying more for gasoline, and, you know, it's up, what, a dollar fifty at least a gallon more than it was a year ago. They're paying more uh, at the grocery store for yeah. Uh, just basic staples. You shouldn't tell parents they, they don't have any say in what their kids learn at school. <laughs> exactly. We had this conversation at breakfast. Quite, quite an amazing. And it's you know what's great about this race, too, is it's also easy. It's a, There's an easy path to success for Yunkin because these are easy promises to fulfill. Okay. Oh, he just has to rescind the CRT policy. And, and like, people refute this, but we looked it up. There is a CRT policy that was put down by Northam. And it literally says you will teach critical race theory because it's not always the case, right? A lot of times people are complaining at school boards and, and then they're like, well, there's no class called CRT. What are you talking about? But you know, when they're like, no, but they're, but they're teaching CRT infused material, right. you know, and they call it something else like diversity and inclusion or microaggressions or, 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 or unconscious bias training. You know, they, they call it a bunch of different things, but it's all comes from the same philosophy. Um, but in Virginia, they literally were. And, you know, so all Yunkin has to do is rescind that. And he's boom, he's a, he's a hero, yeah, exactly. right? And it's and it's like, I, not jealous or anything, but that it is, it's a, he's in a good place, you know. Yeah. I mean, he's a, he should be on cloud nine. You know, suburban ran, moms wanted to say in their education, but they also wanted to feel safe. And I think the police aspect of it, a defunding the police, hurt the Democrats and help young in yeah, this. Little. Suburban moms wanted uh, us to, you know, politicians to say we support law. I wonder what Ilhan safe. Omar is going to do now. What's her new tagline going to be since her city just uh, voted against the defund the police movement? Yeah. Did you see that, Minneapolis? So they, they had a, something on the ballot. They would, I'm not exactly sure what was on the ballot. It was either, it was, I think it was simply changing 
the police department entirely to a public safety department. I don't know what that would mean in practice. Well, um, public safety in South Carolina means you combine uh, law enforcement and firefighting all in one component. Uh, so they're cross-trained. Okay. Yeah, so. I mean, it might not mean anything in practice, but in any case, it came from the defund the police movement right. and voters still rejected it in an overwhelmingly... What do you think this means to 2022 for the House of Representatives? We, we should have some new colleagues. <laughs> you know, we should, we should have... ours by a, their name, right? Yeah, we yeah. should have... We should, yeah, yeah, well, that's true, yeah. yeah. Uh, we should have quite a few. Um, the question is how many. You think it's a wave election like 2010? I, I don't know. 2010 saw 87 members of my freshman class come in. I think it depends on redistricting, right? Because it, it does seem to me that, you know, red states are sort of locking in uh, districts. Blue states are locking in districts. And I, I'm not sure what that's going to mean for how many swing districts actually exist by the end of this redistricting But, but you year. saw Texas pick up some seats. You saw Florida yeah. pick up some seats. Montana picked up a seat. Those should be Republican pickups. Oh, well, they definitely will. Um, so that, yeah, I mean, yeah, so you've got like... That's probably six or seven right there. So it seems inevitable, right? And I, I, what I'm hoping for, too, is that this is a big wake-up call to Democrats in Congress on this reconciliation package because, it, I mean, it's radical. I find new things in this thing every day because at a certain point, you got to stop reading it and say, okay, look, I'm against it. 7,800 points <laughs> I mean, of, yeah. you know, yeah, I, I can only fit so many bad ideas into my <laughs> head at one point before I start to lose my mind. So, yeah. yeah, I mean, I found out the other day they were cutting the small business tax credit. You know, that was, a, that was from 100% to 50%. I found out that they were talking about um, uh, not, not just, not just uh, re-implementing the SALT deduction, which, which helps uh, wealthy earners in places like New York and California not, and New Jersey. Not just that, but making it retroactive. So you'd actually be paying wealthy earners for the taxes. I mean, could you, you can't it's make this stuff you up. You can't man. make this stuff up. And that was up. just in the first hundred pages, right? I mean, yeah. it's ridiculous. And I don't know if that stuff stays in. I mean, we don't know what's in it still, but. Um, well, I disagree with you. I think they're going to go hard left. I think they're going to say the reason they lost in Virginia is because they didn't pass a reconciliation package and because mm -hmm. of the quagmire up here over infrastructure and they need to go, you know, full money here and, and pass those. I think that's where they're going to go. That's They're going to blame the failure of House Democrats and the progressives for Virginia. I think you you might be right. I mean, I, I just I hope you're wrong. I, I hope they 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 moderate the the reconciliation package as much as possible. I just hope it emboldens the moderates to stand strong, right? Because because you know, Mansion is, Cinema is, right. but we have no. I don't know who I would point to in the House. Uh, Henry, Henry Cuellar is the closest thing yeah. I could come to. Yeah, yeah, he's great. And there's no blue dog Democrats anymore. I served yeah. with some back when I first got here, and uh, they're gone now. I yeah, gonna, I, I wanted to. I, go I didn't know seven. whether I would say this or not, but go Braves! I mean, we we brought the, the you World Series have, trophy yeah. back to the South, and, and we're and, done. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we're done. <laughs> you know, I, had, I grew up watching the Braves. They're right there, our closest home team. I know Houston's your area, but. I have so many mean things that I want to say to you right now, <laughs> but um, but I'll say this instead. I'm glad that if the Astros are going to lose, that the Braves won because I really love the poetic justice. Yeah, of MLB. Woke MLB. They stuck it in the MLB's eye. Yeah, you're going to take the All Star game from us. We'll just win the World Series. Yeah, yeah. So that was that was good. I mean, overall, yesterday, um, great day for America. We're recording this right after the the Virginia election and that unfortunate World Series. Um, you know, I had a prosthetic eye made, an not Astros prosthetic eye made that I was going to wear today. Right. And there's no point now. You, you want to invest in a Braves <laughs> one? Is that what you're saying? No, I'm, I don't. I'm joking, but. No, I don't. <laughs> no, I don't. No. I, and I wonder if uh, the designated hitter rule actually favored the Braves. It'd be an interesting thing to look at because, you know, they played under the AL rules there, the home field rules. Hmm. And I don't know if the designated hitter actually played into it or not, but so the Braves cheated. No, it's the law. Sounds like it's you're the saying they cheated. No. Okay. Well, like it's on I said, the. Record. I don't know if it was a designated hitter that uh, scored or not. Yeah. <laughs> but it would be an interesting thing to look at. It would be. Yeah. All right, but well, we got baseball out of the way, um, and uh, we don't need to talk about the Democrats anymore. God, let's let's see what happens this week um, with, with with everything they're doing. I, I do like seeing them fall apart and. Um, I, I, 
mostly because it's good for America, right? And I think it's important that I, that yeah. I, that I put that in context. That they're not getting anything. Yeah, done, because right? you, you, you put this bill through and it's bad for America. It's um, because it, it, it would be good for us politically. I mean, everything they do is good for us politically, but it's really bad for America. So I'd really like them to stop um, just on every front. It's frustrating. We, we could talk forever about these things. Um, Jeff, thanks for lending us your expertise. Uh, thanks for your work on the Energy and Commerce Committee. It's, um, it's important that people realize, let me say this, and this is going to sound insulting to some people, but it's important that people realize that there's actually smart people up here <laughs> in, in Congress. There are a few. Not everybody. Yeah. <laughs> Not everybody. Because uh, there's a lot of performance that happens up here. And I say this often, there's legislators up here and there's performers and we need legislators. And uh, now I, I admit I try to be both. Um, but but we need people who who know things and read books and uh, and actually know what the arguments are and know how to write legislation. So pr- appreciate appreciate uh, your service up here. Thanks, Jeff. Well, well one thing is uh, we didn't touch base on, but the House Energy Action Team called HEAT is a group of Republicans that are working on energy policy. And when you talk about bringing the, the people with expertise together, that's one thing HEAT does. Mm-hmm. It, it does. It brings it's Republicans good. that are interested in energy group. policy that bring some expertise to the to the table and actually work on how to put forward good policies. And um, that's one thing I enjoy. More than energy and commerce, we, we work on so much other things in energy and commerce, but yeah. the House Energy Action Team really uh, is doing great things. Yeah, here. and it's a cool name, yeah. Heat. All right. All right, thanks, <laughs> yeah. Dan. Appreciate hey, thanks, it, Jeff. Yeah.